it's really, really natural. And we're about to go any second. But yeah, we're doing the noddies. National yeah, TV, nothing to worry about. <laughs> That's it. How many millions? <laughs> One. So, Renee, you have been performing and recording for more than a quarter of a century. Could you have ever imagined doing anything else? No. No. Um, probably living in a mental home, maybe. I mean, what happened in the beginning? Can you remember how music first sort of sucked you in and addicted you and you realised it would be your life work? I wish I had something really great and deep and serious and important to, uh, in the shape of a story to tell how, how music got me involved. But it was as simple as in being in the lounge room with a hairbrush, singing and miming to somebody on bandstand. But everybody did that. I mean, well, I did that. Well, this is what I mean. I mean, it's, you know, it was just this ordinary thing, except I used to sort of go, well, I'm better than them. Yeah. And then a guy would come on and he'd say, I go, I'm better than him too. I'm better than her and I'm better than him. I should do this. But then I never thought I would do it because I, I sort of came from a family where academics were important and, you know, even though they knew I wasn't gifted in that area, they thought they'd push me as far as I could go. Um, so I never thought I'd get into the business, but I, I toyed with it in the lounge room. But there was no serious sort of studying. And I tried really hard to get them to let me play piano and they, they thought it would lead to no good. Why did your parents think it was, would lead to no good? What I did think, they want you to do? I think they just didn't think it would, would, would end up anywhere and so it was a waste of money. They, they were migrants and it was the 50s and the 60s and I think they, they sent me and my brothers to a private Methodist schools. We, we're Jewish, we were Jewish kids but they wanted us to get a really great education so they sent us to these private Methodist colleges and they spent a lot of money on our education. I think probably financially they thought you know, piano lessons and buying a piano would be, you know, what's it going to amount to? Mm. No good. Little did they know. <laughs> I still amounted to no good. <laughs> but what did they say when they first realised you had this incredible voice? I mean, here you were, this white Jewish girl in Sydney with this strong, black, powerful voice. Um, <clears throat> there wasn't a moment when that sort of, I mean, uh, I think they sort of learnt about it by association and through other people going wow and reading about it and seeing it on TV I think they're as baffled as I am about it yeah. we don't know you don't know where it came we're not, from? We, we're worried we don't know well, well, yeah. how did you get it? we don't know we don't I mean you know as I get older I uh, since they found those black Ethiopian Jews remember the that time in I think it was the 70s they found the lost tribe of black Ethiopian Jews and sort of shot down this whole sort of moral thing that a, that a lot of um, European Jewish people sort of had where they were trying to keep, you know, very secluded and within their own people and stuff. And then they found this roaming tribe that was lost for hundreds of thousands of years and there they were. And um, it sort of shocked a lot of people. But when I think of that, I think, well, you know, Makes there's sense. the connection. I mean, the, the Wailing Wall, the Dovening, you know, the than the spirituals and the blues. I mean, there is a connection mm. with the black thing, I guess. But I guess some philosopher down the line will, will do a lot better at explaining it than me. I, I have no clue other than that, maybe. So what traits do you think you did get from your parents? Oh, God. Um, uh, impatience, worry, guilt. <laughs> Very pragmatic because of my parents, um, you know, all the Jewish things that you get. <laughs> I'm sure you're a nice Catholic girl, aren't you? I'm not no. Catholic. I'm oh. nothing. He well, doesn't even know I'm here. I'm not even christened. Really? Yeah. Me neither. Really? Yeah. But, I mean, has, has your religion played a part in your, in um, your life? Um, uh, in retrospect, yes, maybe. But I don't think I thought about it. And I don't think about it as I go through life. But... When you look back on things, you actually, when you look back on it as another person or looking at the story of what you've done, you can see similarities with your parents and, mm. and your race and your culture. Because to me, being Jewish is more than a religion. It's, a, it's really a race of people. Yeah. Um, and you just can't escape it. That's the way you are. And it's great. Um, 
And it, it must go hand in hand with it, but I don't quite know where and how. And I think to sort of delve too, too much and try to put my finger on it would sort of ruin it or something. But when you were young and you were, you were singing such black music, you loved black music, did you ever sort of naively wish that you were black? Oh, yeah. Did you? Absolutely. I went all, all the way through that. Um, and, um, you know, as silly as that was, as, as it would be for a black girl in America to wish she was a white girl, you know, just... But just the love of the music and the look uh, in the 60s and the 70s, of black record covers and um, the Supremes and and all of that sort of stuff. Um, yeah, but um, then, then I s used to stop listening to my favourite people like Aretha and stuff because I didn't want to get too steeped in it because it's very easy to get taken over by these people, consumed by them if you love them that much. So I sort of put them aside, put them to bed and bring them out for a treat every now and then. So back to the singing, how did you get from in front of the telly with the hairbrush onto the stage? Um, I had a really good friend, Judy, who had friends of hers who had a band from school and um, they were looking for a singer. I was about 16 or 17 and she knew I could sing because we used to sing, both of us used to sing together in the lounge room. So um, I said, well, get me an audition. I'd love to give it a try. And so I did. I went to an eastern suburbs house, a rich Jewish boy had a band and... Um, Lots of great shiny new equipment, but they weren't very good players. But um, um, and I remember singing "To Love Somebody," the Bee Gees song, and, and that was it. They were all they were sort of really cool and sort of cold as I walked in. And after all that, we were all very good friends. So I sort of knew that I had something going. And was that it for you as that was well? It for me. Yeah. I, I then went up the ladder of sort of Bandsville. Just I kept dropping dropping bands when I found a better one. I was ruthless. <laughs> you were ruthless. Absolutely ruthless. And incredibly determined as oh, well. Oh yeah, to this day. I mean, I, you know, survival of the fittest. I mean, you, you, your music, you know, you either play good music or you don't. And uh, you can really love somebody and be friends with them, but if they're not doing their job or they're not talented or cutting the mustard, then Hasta la vista, baby. So have you, have you lost friends along the way? I'm or? sure. I don't have any friends. I'm very lonely. <laughs> you do. I don't have, look, I don't have many musician friends. Very few. I've got maybe a handful in, in Sydney and a little handful in Melbourne. Um, and I'm sure we'd be friends even if they weren't. And, and some of them are not in bands with me. So uh, we're just like-minded on some levels and we get on. But um, yeah, I, I'm sure I've made enemies. I don't hear about it to my face, but I hear about it. I hear about the cold shoulder and how dare, you know, that how um, warm and great when it's all happening and then how cold and the cutoff is so complete and cold and finished when it's all over and, you know, what can you do? You, you, you think know. that that's what you've done to them or that's what oh, they no, that's do what to I've you? done to them. Right, yeah. And so there's resentment, um, on that on that level but mm. um but in the end i really have most in common with them when we're doing what we do and when that's finished it's it's cold it's ruthless but it's the truth at least i'm telling it like it is yeah i mean you always have told it like it is the whole I way know, through your career shocking, isn't it? <laughs> do you think in some time ways for me that... to start not telling so much like it is oh really you think Maybe. perhaps you should have been less less uh honest yeah, it's got me into trouble. Is mm. that the difficult woman tag? I mean, you named an album yeah. after it. You took well, the piss Paul out wrote of it me a, a song, didn't he? It's Paul's fault, Paul <laughs> Kelly's fault. Nothing to do with me. He wrote the song, and every. I mean, how can you have a song called "Difficult Woman" on a record and not call that the album? You know, all the uh, other songs were called, you know, "Close" and "Love Is," and I mean, you know, you're going to call it "Difficult Woman." It's a marketing ploy. But how do you feel about the tag? I don't care because um, people who really know me and have known me for a long time um, above above and beyond being in bands with me know know you know where where I'm at and what I'm about and um, and, I, and I know it's a cliche and boring or you know that women get called difficult and men just get called interesting or you know, artistic artistic or whatever it is but, yeah you, know, you do get that a little bit it's a double standard isn't it? I mean they can trash hotel rooms you know 
have lots of groupies, refuse to do things, mm. and they just get called artistic. And then Courtney the... does it, and look what happens. Well, Courtney gets called difficult too. Courtney Love, yeah. She is difficult. <laughs> I'm a baby lamb next to... Actually, Courtney, I'm your lost mother. I'm the mother you were looking for, and I say, you're a naughty girl. Stop it. No wonder I gave you up at birth. She'd probably see you as, like, you know, a role model. I don't think so. You think she's too she's difficult? Too she's cocky. gone too far. No, she's too cocky. Mm. Too full of herself. So which is what line. we love. I, I, I like that about her. And um, I, I, a lot of people have said that you look like a young Courtney Love. Or she looks like an, an old Renee. Poor girl. Um, but uh, I think it's a compliment. But, yeah, I think, I think the, the woman being difficult tag is just old and tired. And it's just, you know, uh, you're just getting on with it. You yeah, know, and taking no nonsense. Basically, that's what it's about. And the minute you do take nonsense, and you you're difficult. So I can't help that. I remember watching you on Countdown when I was little, and I mean, to me, it was the entire highlight of my weekend. But you always had a real sort of a healthy disdain for the entire process. I thought because Countdown was so powerful, wasn't it? It was but powerful. You, you didn't really play along with that. Well, not because I thought it was so powerful. I just hated doing the whole. The whole idea of going into that room and standing on a stage with these really... Remember that show, Our Gang? Um, that, that old TV, that old show from the 30s and the 40s where there was these little kids and they were called Our Gang and there was a guy, there was the bully. They all were like, there was like 20,000 bullies. Kids all going, where's Daryl? Where's Shirley? <laughs> And you just like, and their hands would be on the platform where you'd be walking, and you'd be just going, oh, tempted to go. Yeah, I'll give you Daryl. It was just a, it was just a real. It was. I watched it every week, regardless of whether I was on it or not, because you just couldn't wait to rip it to shreds, or, or every now and then something great would come on, like Iggy Pop doing "I'm Bored." That was one of the best pieces of television mm. I think I've ever seen. But most of the time, it was pretty naff and. Going in there, TV is not a great medium for those who are impatient, you know, and those who are spontaneous, because it's all about miming or singing to a backing track, which is totally unnatural, full-on, you know, makeup, hair, and you usually end up looking like, you know, James Brown with the... <laughs> just, you know, and they all had... The, they used to have the orange makeup that everyone used to get. Even Marsha Hines must have got the orange makeup. <laughs> Um, and then you go on and then you're on for like, you know, five seconds flat and then it's all, like, all over and you've lost the whole day. Yeah. Just the process of television. It's easy to moan and whinge, but I've never liked the whole process of it. But and the I thought time I was getting of... better. I thought I was hiding it more. But... but you couldn't avoid it, could you? Like you just had to do Countdown in that time. And now we have Hey Hey. It's, it's even worse. Not for much longer. I can say anything. this because I'm on it and this will already have aired. <laughs> and I will have already been on it. Not going on it again. I hate that show. So, in terms of doing stuff like you know countdown and those things, I mean, you always do like look like you're sort of separated from it a bit. But do you think some? Do you wish sometimes that you could just embrace it and bat oh, the yeah. eyelids and just say, "Oh, you're so wonderful and you're oh, so yeah. fantastic." I mean, absolutely. Yeah. I I envy people that can be eternally positive and come on and switch on to this thing that they become when the cameras roll. I envy that. I, I hate it, but I envy it, and I wish I had that knack. But I wish that I had that knack but still could be myself when I'm not doing that thing. But i got a feeling that those people that can do that, I don't think they can shut it off. Or they can't completely. switch off. I don't think they... I don't know... So I don't you know the... anyone that does that thing real well that's really a kind of down-home, real person when you talk to them off. Or if they've been doing it for many, many years, I think it becomes this sort of glazed thing that they're just used to being talking heads and hi, caring and sharing, you know, all that sort of... Um, and I, I envy it because I would have gotten a lot further in my career if I had been that way. I'm sure of it. Um, because this disdain that you say you might, that you saw, I'm sure a lot of other people saw it too, and it's probably not something that a really big entrepreneur or promoter or record company would go, oh, there's a girl we can make money out of. <laughs> but so. I saw it as a healthy disdain. I yeah, mean, but that's I you. I, I can't see a corporate situation thinking that was a healthy... Mm. Maybe now 
it's kind of groovy to have the disdain. I really meant that disdain, though, in those days. In the 70s, it wasn't good to have, to look like that way. Yeah. You were supposed to actually be getting the joke, and I never really did. So in some ways, you sort of wish you could have done that. But, I mean, how do you measure success then, given that? Not by that. Not by that. I consider myself successful because I'm still recording, still making records, whether they're good or terrible it doesn't matter i'm in the business i'm still making records i think they're still pretty good i'm still interested in writing songs still interested in meeting new musicians and working and i'm always thinking of something new to do and if i'm still doing it now 28 years later then then i'm okay i think that's that would be success yeah now if we talk monetary success or big chart success or you know superstardom then no but i uh, i don't know if that is a measure of success and that alone. I mean, that is fleeting too, you know. Mm. Mm. But I wouldn't like to say I don't want that. I would love to have that. I would love to be, you know, I don't know if I want to be a superstar. I don't know what that means. I'd like to have like a big, you know, number one hit all around the world. But and you've always wanted on, on your terms, really, haven't well, you? Well, you know what my favorite thing would be? If I wrote a song, because I'm starting to write a little bit, if I co-wrote a song and someone like Aretha Franklin recorded it, and it became a huge hit and brought her back to the fore with a song that I had a hand in writing. That all the accolades, you know, the, the fame part goes to her, but the money and the sort of pride thing, I get that, all that. And I can sit in a coffee shop and hear it and go, oh, I did that song. I wrote that song. That, to me, would be the ultimate of superstardom, but without, you know, the sort of paparazzi sort of version. Mm, without having to put yourself mm. on the line. Yeah. Because the other thing is that, that during that time, I mean, I call it a, a healthy disdain, but it also looked like you were calling the shots yourself. So to me, you are probably, if I'd started thinking about feminism, you are one of the women I would have seen as a feminist. But you don't use that word, do you? No. What's, what's wrong with the F word? It's not a good word. Uh, because of everything that goes with it. And, and um, because it became an organisation, I think, a club. And I think the minute it became like a, a group that you joined, any group is, uh, the, unless it's a band, <laughs> um, <laughs> is um, sort of unhealthy because it's sort of like us against them sort of thing, you know. And I, I just never felt that way. I think a, f you know, a true strong woman is someone who just does what a strong man does. You just get on with it. If you're good at something, you follow that path and you try to get as far as you can doing that thing that you're good at. Mm. That's the measure of a strong person and um, maybe there wasn't a lot of women, I mean you have to probably um, acknowledge that there wasn't a lot of women doing that in the 70s maybe, but it's not where it came from. It wasn't me going, um, you know, I'm a woman, let's see what I can do for my sisters, you know. Um, but isn't there strength in numbers? Didn't you ever feel that? Uh, I just never belonged to that group I, mm. and I'm not saying that I hate the group or I just never belong to it. I feel like it would be blasphemous for me to say I'm, to talk about feminism when I was never part of that thing. Not because I didn't want to be, I just didn't fit in really. I just, I just am a loner. Regardless of man, woman, I'm just a loner, so. Uh. What about um, It's a Man's World, singing that song? Well, Helen Reddy drove me to that. <laughs> Why? I am woman. I love that song. I know, I know you told me that, Sarah. I'll let you have that one. But I just think so it was what, probably the to... worst song I ever heard in my life. And it's fair enough. And then when James Brown's "It's a Man's World" was sort of around, well, actually, James Brown's song was around before then. But I think I must have heard it again around that time and thought, "Yeah, that's the way to go," because it says the same thing, really. Would be not, life would be nothing without a woman or a girl, but it's sort of done in such a great kind of manly way, but still saying the same thing, which proves everything that women in China sort of say, that, you know, we can be just as strong and um, definitive and blah, blah, blah. I just hated the blatant, blatantness of the I am woman thing. It's too cutesy. <laughs> it's really kitsch and great now to look back on, but at the time it was horrible. <laughs> and I'm a little older than you, I so can imagine. I remember I can the actual, imagine. you know, week that it came out and it was everywhere and it was like, Everybody thought it was a joke. <laughs> so in terms of that song, your song, though, I mean, which wasn't your song, but you've made it your song, It's a Man's World. Has your perspective on that changed over the years? 
No, it's still a man's world, pretty much. Mm -hmm. But it but it hasn't hindered my climb up the ladder of <laughs> climb sideways on the ladder of um, uh, music and success in Australia. Anyway, it's a man's world, definitely. The hierarchy, in the corporate corporate world, which the music industry is now, is m man oriented. There's, it's starting to change a little bit, and it's great. I, I prefer dealing with women than men, but um, but it's still very man-oriented. Because now you're producing Vicar and Linda's album. With Paul Kelly. With Paul mm. Kelly. And, and did you wish when you were doing that that you had someone like you all those years ago? Yes. To help you when you were starting yes. out? Yes. Yes. Another woman? Well, yeah, and I sort of do have someone like me managing me. I, I manage myself. Yeah. But I have a terrible, terrible client, <laughs> terrible artist. <laughs> I'm the only one that can handle her. Um, but uh, in terms of a producer in the studio, there's never been a vocal producer in this country. Not really, not really on the sort of soul sort of area. Um, it's something that I, they completely um, brought it up. They called me out of the blue about seven months ago and asked, and I was shocked. And I, they, we were friends, and they knew I was fans of theirs, and... Um, but they, I was shocked, and then I thought about it and went, well, makes sense. I'm good at, you know, I'm actually better doing that than I am with myself, because I have more patience with somebody else than, than, with, than with myself. You're, are you your own worst critic? Oh, absolutely. And yeah. I'm, you know, insecure and, you know, and uh, erratic and, you know, because you've got all these ideas in your head and you're, you're making up the music, you, and it's you on the line and, and all that stuff, but when you're looking after somebody else you're you're sort of like mothering them and you're helping them but you're disassociated to a point you can go home then it's theirs you know mm -hmm. and what they do with it is is their business but um i found it so stimulating and i'd like to do more of it if the if the right situation arrives so in terms of being your own worst critic and being hard on yourself i mean in the music industry you're so dependent on what other people are thinking about you and saying about you and coming to watch you and yet you're even harder on yourself than they are i mean it must you must battle with trying to keep a strong sense of self sometimes and self-respect and ego if you're even harder on yourself than other people are mm, it's just a very fine line very fine balance of uh you know uh, basically in that case you know in the end i am and most of my friends who are very very um, I don't want to say gifted because that makes me more pompous than saying I'm gifted, but friends of mine that are immersed in the thing that they do, um, they all have those insecurities. You, you do. Yeah. You, you, you are balancing that all the time. Because you're so possessed by one part of yourself, mm. because that's such a focus of your life. It sends other parts of your life crazy. Oh, Is that what you mean? other parts of your life are just in turmoil. You're just a mess. You're just a blob of nothingness on any other level. A blob of mediocrity. You don't seem like a blob of oh, mediocrity. I am. I'll trust. I really am. I have one thing that I do absolutely amazingly, and I know that I'm really good at it. I'm, I can really carry a tune in the style that I have. Um, I really think that I've come to an age where I, I've got the balance without having to now think about it of not you know, over-emoting or being too mawkish and just being able to get the essence of the song to somebody without showing a whole bunch of tricks and stuff, which, you know, I don't even mind that so much, but it's something I've grown out of. Um, and I'm really good at that. Everything else, trust me, I'm very mediocre. I have a messy sort of home life. Um, it's, it's fine, and I'm okay. No one has to sort of worry about me. But it's like, you know, nothing is as organized as the way I run my um, singing life. Mm. So, you know, it's the way it is. So given that, do you have any regrets? No. Because, if, you know, if I didn't go to that band rehearsal or join, you know, start doing band singing and stuff, I truly think I'd be in a nut house. Because I didn't, I don't, I've never fitted in with a, a normal sort of girl image. Um, and in the 60s and 70s and the 50s when I was little and growing up, I never fitted in. I was always... Um, rebellious and too independent for my own good and tomboyish and, and um, 
You never um, wanted to just grow up and have babies and... I always sort of fantasized about it, but then I'd go, but it, in the end, I got pregnant many times in my life. And, and it's probably not, you know, it's not nice for a lot of people to know, because I know there's a lot of uh, right to life is probably watching, but I've always thought that, no, I'm not ready. I am just haven't been ready. And... Um, but the thought of it is wonderful. I would love to have a child, I would love to have a family and a picket fence and because I've grown up with a very I've grown up in a middle class Jewish family where I, all those things are what everybody wants and so in one way I'm like that, but then I have this troubling dark streak that has always which has led me to be what I am now. And um so I know that if I had have been corralled in the way that I was meant to go, like, you know, I think they had a, a plan for me to go to university just to meet a husband, a nice Jewish boy, you know, which a lot of girls did in, in those days. In the 60s, you would go to uni, maybe do two years of some subject and meet some guy and then... Drop out. Drop out. And, um, and if I had gone that way, I'd have a really unhappy or dead husband, you know, from me killing him or something, <laughs> and um, unhappy children and... Um, uh, or I would be in a nut house, or I'd be dead from drugs or something like that. Actually, I want to bring up back um, to the 70s. Is this 70s. interview getting very maudlin? No, not really. We don't it's want to get too dark, do we? <laughs> no, it's, it, it, it's honest, it's good. It would have been dark if you'd gone the other way. Thank God for music. But I mean, back to, you mentioned drugs. I mean, in the 70s, was it as hedonistically drug-filled, sex-filled, crazy, wild fun as everybody tells us, my generation? No, I think... We had our moments, but they were, you know, they were far and few in between. For me, anyway, I had some great times. There were no, the, the repercussions weren't as great as they are now. There were not that many um, deaths. Was, AIDS wasn't a factor then. Um, you know, apart from Jimi Hendrix and Janis Joplin and people like that dying, there was no local deaths for to really bring it home. So drugs were not as taboo and in the rock and roll business it's a very odd job that you have you you are sedentary and kind of dormant all day driving from town to town because in those days you would just be constantly driving everywhere and doing nothing for the whole day and doing destructive things to your body eating twisties and and then all of a sudden for two hours at night you become this emotional from the waist up athlete and not only physically, but as I said, emotionally, you'd be doing this kind of sexual sort of um, kind of thing, but it was sort of masked, so you're not overtly, but you're... It's a very complicated thing going on when you're on stage doing a sort of a contemporary music thing, because you're sort of... It's all about attitude, but mm. you're trying not to be full on, so you're keeping back, but then you're emoting it's natural and it's all these things for two hours it's an athlete's thing so uh, they're like and then it's enhancing yeah and then you then you finished back to like hmm, what are you gonna do you're gonna you know you've got all these fires have been lit in your body and the show's over but the fire's still burning what are you gonna do you gotta you got you know there's drinks and if there's something around that chemically suitable you'll dabble you'll go you know I mean it was all about unwinding there's there's a different way of thinking nowadays people are so much more in tune um, you know yoga wise you know Buddhist wise there's a, there's a lot more education in terms of how you have how you spend your day if that is your job at night I mean Mick Jagger's probably got it down to a fine art he, He's like the most healthiest 70-year-old. Still old. having Is a lot of seven? sex, though. <laughs> um, but, you know, he's all, you know, meditation and, you know, you know everything's kind of like... He, he treats yeah. it like he's a runner or something. And so... But in the 70s, we didn't... You know, it was like, oh, my God. You, there's no way you can go home, go to bed mm. right after you've just done this amazing sort of um, fire-burning act. I mean, given that, though, you know, there's this whole thing now of, like, the baby boomer generation of just say no to drugs to the younger people of today, when really they should be the ones understanding it more, shouldn't they? Absolutely. Um, but I think, yeah, I, I, I think you have to 
hand it down and, and explain what, what went on. But then again, I sort of am of the mind that there's no way um, that anyone would have stopped me when I wanted to get out of it or, or partake in whatever it was. And I know that would happen with any generation. And you can, you can in as, as least sort of sermon-like as you can, explain what, what has gone down and how many... And nowadays, it's, it's ridiculous because it, it's so easy to get things like heroin and people can get a $5 bag and go and shoot up and they die because it's incredibly... It comes from Asia and it's this incredibly pure stuff that they only need a tiny bit and they're dead. And it's a whole different ball game and um, it's very dangerous um, and I think they all need to be warned but then you have to just let them do what they do and um, as far as you know another whole thing that shooting gallery thing makes such sense to me because it's um, people are dying from from um, administering it in the wrong way they're always going to go and do it so doing it you know Supervise is such a such a sort of logical grown-up thing yeah. to do. I don't and understand. Australia, Australia seems to ha have a much more mature and uh, less uh, sort of strict role on and ideas about drugs and stuff. But you went off and lived in America in the late 80s. What drew you to the states, and how did you fit in there? The music, yeah. the music really, and also um, hating Australia in the 80s was a musical drought. Mm. For, for me, um, probably for a lot of people, um, the closest thing to R&B in Australia in the 80s was Lionel Richie and Michael Jackson's Thriller, which were great records, but they were pop records, you know, they weren't soul records. R&B was always kind of hard to come by, but in the 80s it was almost, you know, it was Flock of Seagulls and Duran Duran and um, uh, In Excess, and I, they were never my cup of tea, you know, yeah. they were good at what they did, but... It so did you fit in in the States? didn't fit in. Oh, in the States? Yeah. Um, I didn't need to. I was, like, visiting at the beginning and just sort of like, oh, my God, everything was so amazing. Okay. No problem. Um, no, the, when you released an album there, there was, um, I mean, you fitted in so well, they thought you were a black singer, didn't they? <laughs> when I first got there, um, the, um, uh, the album that we made, the first album that we made was with um, Polydor and the black A&R people at Polydor was, were the people that were handling me and I was produced by Frank Wilson who produced a lot of Motown stuff, a great black producer over there and um, Heading in the Right Direction was redone for there and when black radio in the east like Baltimore, Cleveland and New York and when they heard that they flipped and were playing it, this was in 76 or something. So Polydor flew me to New York to do this sort of massive radio tour um, and meet these people, but then they changed their mind and thought, um, no, uh, and because it was black radio uh, predominantly, and they thought that it would be good to release the album but without my picture on it. And at that time I thought, oh, how <laughs> dare you, it's, I'm me, I'm so proud to be me, I'm such an idiot, because it's business, I mean, I should have should have let, let them do what they wanted to do and then it would have sorted out down the road, you know. Um, but I was just so proud and, you know, I'm me, myself and I, you know, loving this music, so why should I hide? And uh, sure enough, my record came out with my huge, big, wet-haired head on the cover looking as pink and white as possible <laughs> and they dropped the song, like, immediately. Because it was in the years before, you know, George Michael and... Mm. you know, the hole and oats and things like that. So um, that was so funny. Retrospect, I should have listened to them, but these are the things, these are the mistakes I've made. Well, there's one regret, maybe. Being, yeah. <laughs> Your only regret. Oh, there's a, there's a few of those. <laughs> so then you, but you worked with some incredible people, didn't you? I mean, was it the yeah. dream that you hoped for? There's like Neil Diamond, Chaka Khan. Well, um, before that, when I made the, the Stairs and Whispers album, I, Stevie Wonder, a mixture of Stevie Wonder's band and Rufus were my band. And so that was, that was already, for me, a dream come true. They were playing on my record. And um, bass player called Abe Laboreal. I mean, he's just a giant amongst bass players in, in the whole world. And so that was the first sort of inkling. And then, um, then when I much later went to live there, I did session work. I did the Sting, We'll Be Together, 
single and that went to number one all around the world and so a lot of people were wanting the sound of that background that was on there which is what americans do a lot something becomes a hit and then they want another five dozen of those um and so i got a lot of work out of that um neil diamond uh, david foster was his producer and he had me sing a, a, a just like a black wailing part at the end of one of his songs and i can't remember i think it was 1989 the record was out um, Joe Cocker, Shaka Khan, um, John Trudell, the American Indian activist, um, Buddy Guy, Bonnie Raitt, Jackson Brown. Why'd you come home? What drew you home after all that? Money. <laughs> not so much, no, 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 not even money. Um, I had, I've, always, I've always only come home when a record comes out here for me. And it... Um, and Difficult Woman came out. And, and I was, it was really hard work. All those jobs, um, they sound like a lot of jobs, but I was there for nine years. And these were really far and few in between. It was really hard to make a living. I'd have to come to Australia, do a little tour here, take the money back, and it would be, you know, nearly half by the time you get back to America. And it was just really hard to live in the style that I wanted to live in America. Mm. Do you feel um, split though? I mean, you've got really good friends there. I mean, the new, the new album, uh, you've got a song dedicated to your friends in America. So do you feel I sort see of them all between the two countries Always. Sometimes? But I go back. I try to go back once or twice a year, and um, I'm on the phone with them all the time, and, you know, I'll get a computer and I'll do the email yeah. thing. But um, I, I miss them, but this is... I'm happy. I'm so happy. I live in Melbourne, and I've never been more uh, complete as a person as when I've lived in that town so I think the world has gotten smaller and I don't think it's a big thing anymore to just mm -hmm. get on a plane and go to the States and my friends are there Johnny Lee one of my best friends is a guitar player he was just here with Fogarty John Fogarty and uh, Mac Ian McGlagan was here with um, Billy Bragg and both those guys are with me on the So Lucky album and have been great friends ever since so I see them when they come here and I go over there. So, I mean, I still see them, but yeah, it's, a smaller it's world. still not worth living there and being so broke. And so at 46 years of age, which I will be this year, it, it's just, it's not funny anymore. It's fine maybe three times, maybe even four times to sort of be struggling a little bit to pay your money every month, but not over and over and over again. You just need some certain stability, and I just seem to have it in Australia. Mm. And, I'm as, and, and in the end, I hate to admit it, sort of, I guess, but I'm a very Australian person. Very, I like the realistic attitude of Australians and the sort of happy-go-luckiness, and I, I fit in with that, I think. And you're working with Paul Kelly as a, a songwriter who's going to be bad. the songwriter that captures Australia. He ain't Australia. chopped liver. Sorry? He ain't chopped liver. <laughs> yeah, he's exactly. Good. I mean, his songs, you can almost sort of smell Australia through them. It must be incredible to sing them. And That's bring a great across. way of thinking of it. Yeah, you can. I mean, I honestly think he's, um, you know, it sounds all very grand, but, you know, who who was the great poet of, like, Banjo Patterson or, you know, mm. one of those guys yeah. that, that you sort of immediately think and smell and look at Australia. And Paul's, like, really the first guy that did the urban, you know, contemporary Australia. Um, and he just has that knack of painting those little pictures and making, mm. exactly like you said, smelling it. Smelling, you know, Darlinghurst Road. I don't know if we want to smell it too long, <laughs> but, you know, St Kilda to King's, King's Cross. Cross and, yeah. You know, um, amazing. Yeah. So what do you think, to you, makes a good song? Because um, um, you have an incredible I think a good song taste. is nothing without a good singer. Yeah. I mean, first of all, because the song has to be sung. Um, but a good singer doesn't always mean that you have to have technically wonderful pipes. To me, Paul Kelly will sing one of his songs, and it's amazing, and he has his way of delivering a song in his own way. Um, I'm sort of on paper, I'm supposed to be this technically good singer. But, but it's all about um, just getting a simple sentiment across to someone the thing that Paul has that I think is what stands out is that he'll say something in a song that is so simple um, and that probably has been the, the area of the subject has been talked about a billion times but it's never quite been put in such terms 
and so simply and so um, hitting the nail on the head as, as they say and so that's the kind of song I like and then again then you go to other kinds of things which I like which are very sparse lyrically and might just be a great groove and the melody of doom and you just you might grunt your way through it and it's and it's a great song, Still a good song. and it touches somebody just from the actual emotion they get from it so can you ever imagine a life or a future without music no but I can imagine me not um, doing it as a living but it'll always be around my house and stuff but so I probably would be behind the scenes maybe uh -huh. doing it but maybe maybe not in front of the scenes for that much longer that much longer so what's next for you what's the future well I don't know that that's not like I'm not saying anything in the in the near future but you know within like you know maybe 10 years or something I don't know if I'd be doing it past 10 years I don't think it's attractive to be up there wringing your heart out and old and tragic I just don't think it's a good look I think um, I know a lot of people disagree with that but I just uh, and maybe I'll change when I'm old you know older maybe I'll be like well hey I'm still feeling like I can do this but um, I, I'd like to do more production and I, I could probably even manage the odd person I think I'd be really good at that I'm so bossy <laughs> <laughs> well I'm sure there's more, much we're still gonna hear from you ahead thanks a lot for talking to us today. thank you Sarah what do you want us to do now <laughs> oh my Stand god up, I babbled dance. like I can't no, like I've didn't. never babbled in my life no you didn't they were good quizzies. Very good questions. I didn't look at my questions, though, so I don't know if I they got were to good the ones. But I don't know Is if there I anything that you them. missed? Uh, Are they going to come down and adjudicate now? Yeah, they'll make, might, might make me do some things again. Do you think you got anything good there? Yeah, there's a few I good things. Fantastic. You were great. Oh, I didn't talk about how, how you've changed as a performer and, and a, as a person over the years, but I think that came through in the. I think, like I think we sort of covered the waterfront ask. with that interview. Yeah.